Hi, my name is Ryan O'Connell and I'll be your instructor in this discussion, Azure, a high level overview. We're going to discuss Azure Compute, Networking and Storage. Of course, the other uh, apps that go along with Azure or the other services are DevOps, Integration and Analytics. What is Azure? Azure is not just a lovely shade of sky blue. Microsoft Azure is one of the largest cloud computing platforms, serving millions of applications, integrations, and customers. Microsoft Azure is a cloud platform. It offers more than 200 products and cloud services accessible over the public internet. This collection of services, as Microsoft puts it, is designed to help bring new solutions to life and to solve today's challenges and create the future. Announced in 2008 as Project Red Dog, Microsoft has grown to become a major cloud computing player. As of 2021, Azure has 20% of the market share and growing, with AWS at 31% and Google Cloud Platform sitting at 9%. At this current time, Azure has 67 available and announced regions globally more than 160 physical data centers, numerous availability zones, and millions of users. But how does it all work though? Compute. Infrastructure as a service, Azure virtual machines give you the flexibility of having virtualization without having to buy or maintain any physical hardware that runs on it. It's ideal to lift and shift from on-prem and into the cloud, so virtual machines uh, anywhere from Windows to Linux as well as virtual appliance. You don't have to worry about the hardware as Microsoft takes care of all of that for you. Platform as a service. Application services are a pool of services such as load balancing, application performance monitoring, application acceleration, auto scaling, micro segmentation and more. App services are great for web apps, APIs, mobile backend, Docker and containers and of course serverless infrastructure. Azure Container Services. Azure Container Instance is a service that enables a developer to, to deploy containers on the Microsoft Azure Public Cloud without having to provision or manage any underlying infrastructure. You can bundle all your apps into a container and deploy those. Uh, container Instances. Again, containers are somewhat like virtual machines, except they don't include operating systems. This makes it easy to deploy them because they are lightweight compared to virtual machines. In fact, containers run on virtual machines. Azure Kubernetes. Again, just a discussion on container instances. This service lets you uh, run a command, a single command to create a container. If you have uh, more complex uh, containers, you can use the Azure Kubernetes service. For more complex applications that have multiple containers, you can use Azure Kubernetes. This is known as a container orchestrator and makes it easy to deploy and manage multi-container multi applications. Azure Functions. You pay for what you only use. Azure Functions is sort of like an Azure App Service, except it, it executes individual functions rather than entire applications. Azure Functions is a serverless solution that allows you to write less code. When you provision an App Service instant, it runs until you shut it down and you pay for it the whole time it's running. Again, more on Azure Functions. Azure Functions are event-driven compute on demand experience that extends existing Azure application platform with capabilities to implement code triggering by events occurring in Azure or third-party service as well as on-prem systems. Azure Functions allow developers to take action by connecting two data sources or messaging solutions, thus making it easy to process and react to events. Storage. Azure Blob Storage. There are even more options for storage than compute. This is because I'm also including databases and other storage data stores in the storage category. The simplest form of storage is called Blob Storage. It's referred to as object storage or binary large object. It's a storage with a collection of files. It's not like a normal file system because it does not have a hierarchical folder and structure. It has a flat structure and is used for unstructured data such as images, log files, and etc. Azure Blob Storage has multiple access tiers. We have the hot, cool, and archive. 
The hot tier is for frequent access data, files that you access daily. The cool tier is for infrequent access, costs less than the hot tier. And of course, archive, really accessed, great for backups. It's lower storage cost, but higher retrieval costs and can take seven hours or more to retrieve your data. Again, Azure File Storage serves up files that you can mount on Windows servers, Linux or Mac OS using the SMB protocol. On top of that, we have Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, Hadoop compatible file system with integrated hierarchical namespace with massive scale for economy of Azure Blob Storage to use with data analytics applications. Of course, moving on to Azure databases, we have the Azure uh, Relational Database. We have the standard Azure SQL database, very similar to SQL Server, but it's not 100% compatible. If you need to run open source databases, Microsoft has you covered. All the databases are suitable for online transaction and processing. Some of these open source databases are Azure Database for MySQL, Azure Database for MariaDB, and of course, Azure Database for PostgreSQL. Azure Synapse Analytics. If you need to build a data warehouse, then Azure Synapse Analytics is the best choice. If you release an application that attracts a large number of users, you'll find a traditional database can't scale to meet these demands and may crash or just die. A common solution to this is to use a NoSQL database. These databases are designed to handle far more data than the traditional databases. In order to achieve massive scalability, you have to sacrifice something. So they don't support all the features of the relational database, hence the sacrifice. And of course, we can't uh, go, go on about databases without mentioning Cosmos DB. It's an, it's an amazing database that scales globally. Azure Cosmos DB is Microsoft's fast NoSQL database with open I APIs for any scale. And then on top of that, we can use Redis, which uh, Redis, uh, Azure Redis Cache, and Redis is used to speed up applications by caching frequently requested data. And of course, moving now onto networking, uh, VNets. When you create a virtual machine in Azure, you have to put it in a virtual network or a VNet. A VNet is very similar to an on-prem network. Each virtual machine gets an IP address and can talk to other VMs in the same network. Azure subnets. A subnet is a range of IP addresses in a VNet. You can divide a VNet into multiple subnets for an organization's security. Each NIC in a VM is connected to one subnet in one VNet. NICs are connected to the same NUT subnet or different subnets within a VNet can com communicate with each other without any extra configuration. Azure subnets, inbound and outbound traffic. By default, all outbound traffic uh, from a VM is allowed, to the, uh, is allowed to the internet and does have internet access. For inbound traffic, you need a public IP address to that VM. So if you're going out to the internet, that's no problem. If you're coming from the internet into your on-prem, you need to have a public IP address for security reasons. Of course, if, you, uh, if we're talking about uh, VNets, we can't uh, carry on talking about it without talking about Azure pairing. If you want uh, VMs from one VNet to be able to communicate to other VNets uh, on your Azure network, you can connect these VNets using VNet pairing. Uh, so you can actually have two different v VNets and you can join them together and they can communicate with each other if you set up pairing. Note, Kubernetes clusters can also be uh, in VNets too. If you want to uh, connect to your on-prem uh, virtual network and you want to connect to your Azure cloud, you can use a VPN. So if you want to create a secure connection between an on-premise network and a VNet, then you can use a VPN or virtual private network connection. The VPN network sends encrypted traffic over the public internet. Azure Express Route. Azure Express Route communicates over a private dedicated connection between your site and Microsoft's Azure network. Express Route is much more expensive than a VPN. It provides high availability and reliability since it's a dedicated connection. So again, you need to decide whether you want to use a VPN or Express Route. Again, that's going to depend on your budget. 
Of course, some of the other Azure services that we'll just mention is artificial intelligence. It's an open source model format and a runtime designed to accelerate machine learning across a wide range of frameworks, operating systems, and hardware platforms. And then of course, we can go on and talk about DevOps. DevOps is Microsoft's product that uh, provides version control, reporting requirements, management, project management, automated builds, testing, and release management capabilities. And it covers the entire application lifecycle and enables DevOps capabilities. Again, these are just some of the uh, services provided by Azure. Again, this little uh, session is designed just to give you that high level overview. So if someone asks you what is Azure, you will be able to explain it. Again, I encourage you to go and have a look at the Microsoft link below, and that'll explain to you really in depth of what Azure is and what all their services are. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move over to the portal and just have a quick scoot through Azure and just see what services there are and give you a overview of the portal so that you have a better understanding again of Azure. Hi, as you can see, I've logged into the portal. So let's go to all services and let's have a quick look at all of the Azure services. If I scroll to the top, you can see under general, we have 18 services such as marketplace, service health, tags, subscription, uh, cost management and billing. Moving down to compute, we've got 29 compute services from virtual machines, scale sets, Kubernetes, disks, snapshots, and of course, uh, hosts. Moving on down, we've got networking. We've got 38 networking services from virtual networks. Uh, load balancers, network interfaces, public IP addresses, security groups, uh, virtual WANs, DNS, uh, traffic profile, firewall policies, firewalls and firewall manager, and again, uh, reserved public IP addresses. Scrolling down to storage, we have 16 storage services from storage accounts. We have service recovery vaults, data lake, uh, Azure data box, we have um, Storage Explorer, which is in preview mode. And of course, we have data shares and much more. Scrolling down, we've got 16 web services from app services to uh, notification hubs, CD CDN profiles, uh, app service domains, and of course, Power Platform, which is in preview. Scrolling down, we've got three mobile um, services from uh, notification hubs, app service, and Power Platform. Moving down to containers, we have Kubernetes, and we have the app service, container registries, and of course, batch accounts. Moving down, we've got 20 database services from Cosmos DB to Azure SQL, Azure Database for PostgreSQL servers, SQL Server, Azure Cache for Redis, data factories, virtual clusters, elastic pools, and more. Moving on down, we've got analytics where we have Databricks, Data Factory, Power BI, HD Insight clusters, uh, event hub clusters and data lake storage and of course log analytics workspace and power platform moving down we've got one service in blockchain moving a little bit down we have nine services in AI from uh, Azure Synapse Analytics bot service machine learning and bonsai moving down we've got 24 IOT services from IOT applications time series insight policies uh, function apps uh, device provisioning uh, Windows IoT 10 core services and Azure Map Accounts and Azure Stack Service and Azure Data Box Gateway. Moving on down, we've got Mixed Reality. As you can see, we have remote rendering accounts and of course, partial anchor accounts. We have 28 integration uh, services from Logic Apps to Data Factories to Service Bus, again to Azure APIs. We have SendGrid and of course, Power Platform and event uh, grid system topics. Moving down to identity, we have 23 identity services from Azure Active Directory, Azure uh, Active Directory Domain Services Groups, Users, uh, AD Connect, uh, Azure AD Security, uh, Azure AD Roles, uh, and security on its own, and of course, different user settings. Moving on down, as you can see, we've got more uh, 24 security settings as well. We've got Key Vault, Azure Sentinel, Azure AD Security. Of course, we have the Security Center there as well. We've got Disk Encryption, and of course, we've got AD Password predict, uh, Protection as well. Moving on down to DevOps, we have DevOps Starter Application Insights. We have Lab Services, Dev Test Labs, and DevOps Organizations. 
Moving on down, we've got Azure Migrate. We've got the Azure Migrate Service, Data Box, Edge Stack, Recovery Service Vault, Cost and Billing. And of course, we have the standard Azure Migrate Service as well. Moving down, on, we've got Monitoring. We have nine monitoring services from Application Insights to Azure Webhooks, Alerts, and Diagnostic Settings and Application Change Analysis. Moving down to Management and Governance, we have Advisor, Azure Arc, Privacy, Policy, Content, uh, management, uh, cost management and billing, sorry. We have customers, managed applications, service providers, automation accounts and solutions, and of course, Azure Lighthouse, education and much more. Moving down to Intune, we have Intune education devices, Intune itself and security baselines. And we have 240 other app services, including uh, app registration, uh, Bing resources, Backup Vault, Backup Center, Backup Items, Azure VMware Solutions. Uh, we can just scroll through the whole list. Deployments, Azure Disk Access, Image Templates, Images, Instant Pools, Kubernetes for Arcs, Live Data Migrators. Uh, we have quite a range of services uh, to go through. And as you can see, there are a huge amount of services in the Azure uh, services. Everything from general to compute, networking, storage, web, mobile, containers, database, analytics, uh, identity, security, DevOps, and more. Again, to create a virtual machine, you would just move over to your virtual machines in the menu here, and you go and create a virtual machine. To create a resource group, again, you'd move over into your resource group. You would click Create and go ahead and create your new resource group. And the same with virtual networks, and the same with your databases, Cosmos DB, SQL DB, and the same with your functions. So this little training session is designed just to give you an overview of Azure and what services they are. You will use some of them, some of them you'll never get to use, it all depends on your role, it all depends on the company, it all depends on what it is you are actually trying to deploy. I'd like to thank you for subscribing to my YouTube channel. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. You guys be awesome you Azure Gurus. Hi and welcome. My name is Ryan O'Connell and I'll be your training in instructor for this training video. In this training video we are going to learn how to create users in Azure Active Directory and we are going to create a user using the portal. We will create a user using PowerShell we will create a user using the CLI and we will create a user using the B2B method. So again, there are four different ways to create a user. We can go in the portal, we can use PowerShell, we can use the CLI and we can use the B2B method. With the PowerShell command, when we're creating a user, it's a two-stage command. The first stage would be to create the password command or the secure string that's, uh, that encrypts the password. The second uh, command would be the actual command that displays the username or creates the user and that would be their username like Ryan O'Connell and their email address and Azure Active Directory needs this information in order to create that user. Using Cloud Shell we switch from PowerShell to Bash and again uh, with the Bash command it's just one simple command and this simple command creates both the password and the user and um, user's email address. The other way to create a user is using a B2B invitation. With a B2B collaboration we can securely share uh, our company's data, applications and services with guest users from any other organization while maintaining control over our own corporate data. We can work safely and securely with external partners whether they be large or small and the cool thing is they don't need to have Azure AD. They don't even need to have an IT department. So we can share a wide range of resources from applications to uh, file shares and etc. So we're going to switch over to the portal and we're actually going to do this live. And then hopefully you will learn something. A lot of you may know how to do this already. A lot of you may not. But just think of it as a recap if you do know how to do this. So I'm going to log into the portal and we'll get this done. Hi, as you can see, I've now logged into the Microsoft Azure portal. In order to create our users, we have to navigate to Azure Active Directory. We can do this from the services section or from the, uh, the pane on the left hand side here. 
So I'm going to select uh, Azure Active Directory. This is going to take us into our Azure Active Directory uh, interface. I'm going to go ahead uh, from the menu here and select Users. I'm going to scroll to the top and select New User. I'm going to go ahead and type in my new um, user. And you can see I've typed in my user. Azure will automatically generate a password for me. I can see what that password is. Or I could go ahead and say, let me create a password. And I can select that and type in my password. As long as the password meets the Azure security requirements, you'll be fine. And of course, you can go ahead and populate the rest of these fields, like with your job info, job title, department, and so on. But in our case, we're just going to leave this blank for now, and I'm going to click the Create button. And this will go ahead and create our new user. So I'm going to go ahead and select PowerShell from the top menu right here at the top. This is going to open up uh, PowerShell or Bash. In our case, this is Bash. And um, you can see we can switch between PowerShell and Bash. So since we're in Bash, I'm going to create our new user. I've typed out a command already and I'm just going to paste this command in and press enter and this will automatically create that new user account for me. Sometimes when you create a user account you may not see it uh, appear here automatically. Just scroll back up to the top here and click refresh and your new user should uh, show up. So I'm going to go ahead now and switch to PowerShell and I get a Cloud Shell warning. Do you want to switch to PowerShell? Please confirm. So I'm going to click the Confirm button because I do want to switch to PowerShell. And as you notice, when I switch to PowerShell, uh, the background automatically changes. I've got this standard blue PowerShell background. And this tells me that I'm in PowerShell. So I'm going to go ahead and paste in my first command in PowerShell and press Enter. And this uh, first command is to do with the user password. I'm going to go ahead and paste in the second command and this second command is actually going to create that user account. And as you can see it's created that user account. So I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller. I'm going to click the refresh button and uh, click it again a couple of times and you'll see now my user has been created. You can see here I've got Clark Kent, Lewis Lane, and Perry White. So I'm going to go ahead and invite a external user to join our organization. So I'm just going to close the Cloud Shell down, and I'm going to uh, select a new user. But instead of creating a new user, I'm going to click Invite User. So I'm going to type in the user's name. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to paste in that user's uh, email address. So I'll paste that in there. I'll type in his first name again. Type in his surname again or last name. And type in a short message. Please join us at the day planet and click invite. Now this is going to go away and send an invitation out to that user. So I'm going to um, navigate now to my um, account, my Gmail account. And as you can see I've navigated to my Gmail account and I've got a invitation. So I'm going to select the invitation here and this is going to open up the invitation email and as you can see it's an invitation from Rocket Labs training it says please join us at the Daily Planet I'm going to go ahead and accept the invitation and this is going to contact Azure uh, Active Directory and Azure Portal and it's going to allow me to join but it's going to bring up a little warning as you can see this is going to tell me that it's going to read my name my email address and my photo I'm quite happy with that, so I'm going to go ahead and click the Accept button, and this is now going to log me in to 
that Microsoft Azure uh, portal or and I'm going to have access to those various resources that have been shared should I have any and as you can see it's now logging me into my um, Azure Active Directory and I can see here where it says all apps if I had any apps that were shared these apps would show up here uh, in my case I've got no apps at the moment this is just uh, to show you how to send an invitation so I'm gonna uh, go back to Microsoft Azure and I'm going to uh, click the refresh button and as you can see Jimmy Olsen um, was uh, that account was created via an invitation and you can see that over here the invitation type and if I click on the Jimmy Olsen you can see here it's got his uh, MS Azure at gmail.com address so and it tells us this is an invitation again uh, going back to our users in Azure Active Directory we can see we've got Clark Kent, Lewis Lane and Perry White and these were all created using um, Azure directly that's why we've got the Rocket Labs the reason uh, Jimmy Olsen doesn't have the Rocket Labs is because he's an external user so this is how you create uh, different users in the Azure portal we've learned how to create a user just by adding a user in the portal we've created an invitation and sent an invitation to an external user and asked them to join we've created a user using PowerShell and we've created a user using Bash a lot of you may know how to do this some of you may not I hope you've learned something in this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next video Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan O'Connell and I'll be your instructor during this training session. In this training session on Azure Basics, we're going to learn how to create an Azure Virtual Machine in the portal. We're going to create a virtual machine. We're going to understand what is a virtual machine and we're going to access this virtual machine via remote desktop. So what is a virtual machine? It's a computer file that is typically uh, called an image, which behaves like an actual computer it's one of the files which contains everything it runs Windows and Linux and etc this gives you the flexibility that you can run multiple machines in a physical computer each of these systems can have different operating systems such as Windows 10 Windows 2012 Windows 2019 server uh, Ubuntu Ubuntu server Red Hat um, and so on each of these virtual machines uh, provides its own virtual hardware and that includes hard drives, CPU, network adapters, and other such devices that we may need. Uh, some cost saving tips, just remember that when we are creating a virtual machine, you pay for the compute time you use on a permanent basis. Pricing is based on the size of the operating system and any licensed software that's installed on it. To avoid corresponding charges when you are not using your VM, make sure that you change its state to stopped or slash deallocate that virtual machine. Even better, if you're not using that virtual machine at all and it's got no purpose, uh, just remove that resource completely. Also, another important key uh, fact uh, to note is not all Azure regions have the same pricing for the same resources, and this includes virtual machines. So uh, again, also you wanna correctly uh, size your virtual machine because if you have the incorrect size, if it's too big, you're paying for too many resources that you don't need. Again, the price for an Azure machine in the USA will be different to a price for an Azure machine in South Africa or an Azure machine in New Zealand or an Azure machine in the United Kingdom. So have a look at your Azure regions and compare the pricing. Sometimes it may make sense to host your Azure machine in the USA for example and you're based in New Zealand again that all depends on your IT infrastructure and that depends on your organization there are three methods to create a virtual machine uh, these three methods are you can use the portal you can use PowerShell and you can use the CLI in our training video we're just going to go through the portal we will cover the PowerShell method and the Azure CLI method in uh, later videos but it's outside the scope of this video this video is just to get you up and running with creating a virtual machine again we're going to use the portal to create our, our virtual machine and we're going to do this live so I'm going to switch over live now into my Azure um, infrastructure 
and let's do this. As you can see, I've gone ahead and logged back into my portal. And you can see we can create virtual machines by either clicking virtual machines here in the Azure services, or we could select uh, virtual machines from the drop down menu here. I'm going to go ahead quickly and create a resource group. I'm going to click the create button and type in a resource group that I'm going to call uh, test VMs and review and create and click create and this is going to create our test VM resource group and we're going to go ahead and put all of our VMs in here so I'm going to navigate over and select virtual machine I'm going to click add I'm going to select virtual machine and I'm going to go ahead and start setting up my virtual machine I'm going to click the resource group select our test VMs from our resource group that we have just created Again, I'm going to select a Windows 10 image. If I click in this box, this will bring up all the images. So we're going to stick with that. If I want to know uh, what where I got this from, just click See All Sizes. And this is pretty cool with Microsoft because it gives us sizes and specs and costs on a virtual machine that we may want to create or use. And as you can see, um, there's quite a, a big price difference in different machines. We also have these uh, other ones here that are not opened up and they are high-end and high-performance VMs. We're not going to be using that. I'm going to select the B, uh, B2S for now. I'm going to type in my username as AZ admin for my uh, user. I'm going to paste in my password because it's quite a long password. And I'm going to scroll down and confirm I have uh, licensing rights. And by default, RDP port is going to be open. I could click review and create, and this would go ahead and create that virtual machine. But let's walk through the process so you can see everything behind the scenes. I'm going to click next. Uh, again, I can select the type of disk I want by uh, clicking in the OS type. And we can either have HDD or standard SSD or premium. I'm going to stay with premium for now. I'm going to click next and this is going to create our VNet, our subnet, our public IP. So I'm going to click next and work our way through. On the monitoring for boot diagnostics, I'm going to disable that because we don't need that because we just um, are creating a demo VM. I'm going to click next and we're not going to tag this virtual machine. So I'm going to click uh, next and this is going to go ahead and create our virtual machine and if you notice here we get a validation error and if we click on that that is because we needed to give our VM a name so I'm going to give this VM1 and I did this on purpose just to show you that if you do skip a step it won't allow you to create that virtual machine you actually have to go back and fix it so again if I went through the steps again you could see it um, kept all of my settings so I could have just clicked review and create. So I'm going to go ahead now and this is going to create our virtual machine. It's going to give us um, everything that we uh, spoke about or everything that we chose during our selection. I'm going to click the create button and this is going to go ahead and create our virtual machine for us. Now this can take anywhere from a couple of minutes to half an hour. It all depends on the type of VM you have selected and as your VM is being deployed it will get uh, resources will get uh, populated in this list so we'll just give it a few minutes while it deploys and through the magic of video I'm going to speed this up and as you can see uh, just a quick note um, it's deploying our IP address our network security group our test VNet our network, our network interface and of course our VM and it will uh, tell us uh, as the deployment progress goes through on how long it takes and as you can see our deployment has uh, completed successfully we can go to the resource by clicking resource here I'm just going to close this down and go to the resource so you can see and this is my virtual machine this is where we start our virtual machine 
and this is uh, where we can stop our virtual machine. I'm just going to head over quickly to our resource group and show you something. It's created this resource group, Network Watcher NG, and you're probably saying to yourself, but I didn't create that group. Where did that group come from? By default, the Network Watcher resources are located in a hidden Network Watcher RG resource group. This is created automatically. For example, a network security group flow log uh, resources and child resources of the Network Watcher are enabled. So, uh, you don't have to do anything. Uh, Microsoft uh, will manage this. The Network Watcher resource group, again, represents the backend service for the Network Watcher and is fully managed by Azure. Customers do not need to manage it. Operations like Move are not supported. However, this resource can be deleted. So I just wanted to show you that so when you see that there, you don't need to uh, get alarmed. If I click in the test VMs, you will notice it's created my VNet, my test VM, my public IP address, a network security group, a network interface, and of course my disks. So I'm gonna move over back to our virtual machines and we're going to click on that virtual machine and I'm gonna click connect. I'm going to select RDP and this is going to allow me to download an RDP file which I'm going to download to my desk now. I'm going to select that RDP file and click connect and this is going to allow me to connect automatically to my virtual machine. So I'm going to go ahead and type in my username which was AZ admin and I'm going to type in or paste in should I say sorry my very long password so I'm going to paste that in and click OK and this is going to establish a connection and as you can see we get a certificate um, warning it's telling us that it's going to connect to uh, VM1 I'm going to click yes and this is going to allow me to open up an RDP session to that virtual machine sorry it's just opened up on my second screen so I'm dragging stuff over so that you can see uh, what's going on and as you can see uh, my virtual machine is in the process of uh, starting up and it's allowing me to log in so we need to give this uh, a minute or two and then it will uh, open up and we can finish the configuration and actually log in to our Windows 10 VM and as you can see it didn't take too long so I'm going to just turn all this off because we don't need it on because this is just a lab machine and I'm going to click accept and this is going to fire up my Windows 10 uh, desktop and we could go ahead and start using this I'm going to turn this off because I don't want to allow it to be discovered on the network for now it's just a test uh, VM so I'm going to scroll down and just move over and click the start button and as you can see this is my Windows 10 machine uh, this behaves exactly the same way as if I was sitting at a physical machine at my desk in my office. If I click on um, the virtual machine to open up uh, files using File Explorer, it behaves just like the real deal. I can go ahead and work on it. I've got all my Windows files here. I can start working with my virtual machine. The thing that you will notice, you'll see it says uh, Windows Azure and this has got some Azure information on here for me. So that's how you create a basic Windows 10 virtual machine and how you connect to it using RDP. So I'm going to go ahead and close this window down and click OK. Another thing that I want you to be aware of is when you go to your virtual machines uh, and we click on that virtual machine, if you notice it's in a running state. While it's running we're paying for it. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this virtual machine and confirm I do want to stop it and this is going to go ahead and stop the virtual machine. The reason you would want to stop a virtual machine is you might want to do maintenance on it, you, want, uh, you might want to delete it. In our case we're not using it so we're going to stop it and any machine that is stopped is deallocated and that means we won't pay for that resource because we're not using it. If I click on this little notification or bell icon this will tell me uh, information on what we've done like the resource group we created our uh, virtual machine was deployed we can close this down and this will uh, execute that command and stop that uh, VM and it'll take a few seconds for that virtual machine to stop I'll just close this down 
and we'll just wait a short while while this VM stops. And as you can see, our virtual machine has stopped. So we can close this down, but you may say, hey Ryan, but it's, it's still running. That's okay, all you have to do in order to um, see if it has stopped, just click the refresh button, and this uh, will tell you that our virtual machine is now stopped, and it's in a deallocated state, as you can see over here which means we're not going to be charged for our virtual machine. So this is how you create a virtual machine. I would like to thank you for viewing. Again, a lot of you may know how to do this. A lot of you may not. So I hope you had fun and learned something in this video. And I look forward to seeing you in the next videos. Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan O'Connell and I'll be your instructor in this lab. Create a Windows virtual machine in Azure. We're going to talk about what is an Azure Virtual Machine. We're going to create a Windows VM using the CLI. We're going to test that connection and then we're going to clean up our resources. Again, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch the video and I'd like to thank you for sub subscribing to my YouTube channel. So what is an Azure Windows VM? A Windows Virtual Machine is a virtual machine that is running a distribution of Windows as the guest operating system. And the Windows operating system can range anywhere from Windows 7 to Windows 10, Server 2012, 2016, 2019, Exchange Server, Windows SQL, and more, as long as it's a Microsoft product. Again, uh, it's a computer or file that is typically called an image, which behaves like an actual machine. It's one of the files that contains everything. Uh, it runs in Windows or Linux and this gives you the flexibility to run multiple machines on a physical computer and each system has a different operating system. So we can run Windows and Linux side by side. Each of these virtual machines uh, provides its own virtual hardware which includes CPU, memory, hard drives, network resources, interfaces and other such devices. Again, when you create a Windows VM there are a few methods to do this. Uh, obviously you can create it through the portal, you can use a Cloud Shell or the CLI, you can use PowerShell or an ARM template or a Resource Manager template. Resource Manager template and ARM template are the same things. Selecting an image is one of the most important decisions you'll make when creating a VM. An image is a template that is used to create the VM. These templates include the OS and often other software such as development tools or web hosting environments. The Azure virtual disks are measured in gigabits, which is not the same as gigabytes. And a size of a gigabit is, is relatively close. For example, as you can see in this PowerPoint slide, you can just multiply your 1074 by whatever size you want it to have your hard drive, and then you will get roughly close to the size you're looking for. Again, what are command shells? Command shells or environments on an operating system such as Windows, Linux or Mac OS where we execute command using text. From the Azure CLI perspective there are two primary shells, Bash and PowerShell. Bash was originally designed for Unix and treats the output as text and PowerShell is uh, originally designed for Windows and treats the output as a command or as objects, sorry, and these uh, Objects will allow you to do scripting, support functions, iOS, and a whole lot more, and the same with Bash as well. Cloud Shell CLI, the Azure Command Line Interface is Microsoft's uh, cross-platform command line experience for managing Azure resources. It's built specifically for managing Azure via the command line. Some of the key features of the CLI are interactive mode, multiple outputs, you can combine multiple commands into a single command, it's flexible with extensions, it's cross-platform which means it works on Windows, Linux and Mac OS and it works all in the cloud shell so it's one place to do everything. It's a really cool tool and I would encourage you guys to learn more about it because it'll help you in your day-to-day -day managing of your Azure environment. Cloud shell versus PowerShell versus the portal, what's the difference between all of these? Well, the Azure CLI is designed to be cross-platform, to work with uh, Linux, Windows, Mac OS. It's easy to use, and it was built specifically for managing Azure via the command line. PowerShell is designed as a scripting and configuration management environment.
for various Microsoft systems and relies on modules in order to support Azure. The portal provides a graphical user interface for managing Azure via a web browser. And then we have software development kits. The Azure SDKs are a collection of libraries built to make it easier to use Azure services uh, from your language of choice. These libraries are designed to be constant, approachable, diagnosable, and dependable, and much more as well. Again, if you're a developer, you'll know more about SDKs, but we're not going in depth to more uh, to explain about SDKs because this is beyond the scope of this training session. Again, the supporting resources created automatically when you create a VM. A virtual disk is created. A virtual disk is a software component that emulates the actual disk drive, such as an optical drive, a floppy disk, a hard drive, so that you get an idea of what a virtual disk is. A VNet or virtual network can be connected to an on-prem network, enabling resources to communicate between each other and provide isolation. A public and private IPs are created. The public IP is used to uh, communicate with the outside world or the outside network, where a private IP address is used to communicate within your own network on your own LAN. On the security groups, it's nothing but a firewall which limits the network traffic at a virtual machine level. It consists of security rules that allow or deny inbound or outbound traffic based on the source, destination, IP addresses, port and protocols. It's there to keep you safe and help protect you. Again, when you create an Azure VM through the CLI, as you can see here is the command. You would say AZ VM create, and then as you can see from this command, we're telling it to create the virtual machine, put it, uh, put it into a Windows VM resource group, name that WinFS01, use a 2016 data center image, use the admin username as AZ user, and then of course the admin password. It normally takes a few minutes to create because not only is it building your virtual machine, but it's creating those network, virtual disks, public IPs, uh, private IP addresses, and security groups as well at the same time. So it does take a, a couple of minutes to create, but then it'll tell you in the Azure portal it's being created. Again, this is the syntax command to delete the resource group. So you would go in and delete that resource group and that would delete your virtual machine and it would delete any other resources created by your VM if your VM was placed in that group, such as your uh, network components, your virtual disk, your security groups, and of course your public and private IPs. Remember when you're running an Azure VM, you must pay for the compute time on a permanent basis. So while it's running, you're paying for it. If you're not running that virtual machine, stop it and put it in a deallocated mode or delete it. Uh, if it's in a deallocated mode and it's stopped completely, you won't be paying for it. You only pay for it, pay for stuff the moment you fire stuff up again. So that's just something to keep in mind. So let's move over into the Azure portal and let's go and create a VM via the CLI. As you can see, I've gone ahead and logged into the Azure Windows portal. So the first thing we want to do is we want to create our very first Windows server using Cloud Shell or Bash. So what we want to do is move over and click uh, Cloud Shell, and this will open up Cloud Shell. And by default, it's gone to PowerShell because that was the last um, interface I was working in. So we want to switch to Bash. So from the drop-down menu, select Bash and click Confirm to switch over. And this is going to switch us over to Bash. Once we've switched over to Bash, we're going to go ahead and create a resource group to put our Windows server in that. So I'm going to go ahead and paste these commands in. This is AZ Group Create. It's going to create the group Windows VM and it's going to put it in the East US location. I'm going to go ahead and press Enter. This is going to go away and create that resource group for us. And as you can see, it was really quick. It didn't take too long to create. I can switch over to resource groups and I can do a refresh. Just drag this down and you will see very shortly my uh, uh, Windows resource group will appear. And as you can see, there's my Windows resource group over here. 
I had to click refresh a couple of times for that to happen, but that's uh, now showing. So what we want to do now is we want to create a Windows VM using Bash. So I'm going to go ahead and paste these commands in that I have, and I'll read them to you before um, we get them sorted out. So I've said create a virtual machine by using the AZ VM create. I've said put that into the Windows VM resource group. I've said let's name that Win uh, uh, FS01. It's a 2016 data center server. The username is AZ user, and that's the password. And I'm going to go ahead and press enter. And this could take anywhere from about a minute, maybe to two or three minutes to create. And then once this is created, uh, you will see a message here saying that it was created. And then we would actually go to the VM and uh, remote in and test that VM. So we'll just wait a few seconds while this uh, runs, and then we will fire up that VM. And as you can see, that Windows um, virtual machine has been created. It put it in the East US location, assigned it a MAC address. The power state is that VM has been powered on, it's running. It's got its private IP address, its public IP address, which is what we use to connect with via remote desktop, and of course, the VM name. So I'll just uh, minimize this for now, and then switch over to virtual machines. And then as you can see, there's our virtual machine. If you don't see your virtual machine there, just click the refresh button and it will fire up. And as you can see, I'm uh, remoting into my virtual machine and you will notice now all of my uh, virtual machine settings are here. I can click this drop down uh, button here and download RDP. This will down, uh, download RDP for me and we can actually connect to that server. So we'll download RDP. And the RDP client has opened up on my desktop. I'm just gonna drag this over and I'm gonna click uh, connect. I'm going to confirm I wanna connect and this is going to ask me for my password. I'm gonna go ahead and type in my password that I had on my um, uh, little bash script. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, yes, I wanna connect. And now we are connecting to our Windows desktop. And this will just take a second. It's just opened up on another window. So I'll just drag this over here. I'll just drag this out so that we can see. And I'll go ahead and close that. And there we go. We've connected successfully to our Windows server. And we've created a Windows server using Cloud Shell. And then we've gone into Cloud Shell and we've created our um, server using bash so I'm gonna go ahead and close this down and close this down and say okay so the thing that we want to do when once we've created our resources it's always good practice to go back and clean up so I'm gonna click on virtual machines I'm gonna go to my virtual machine again and I'm gonna stop this virtual machine I'm going to click OK to stop this server and we'll get a notification here saying that it's stopping that virtual machine. Once that virtual machine has come to a stop, it'll be in a deallocated mode, and therefore we're not paying for it. Uh, we can delete that virtual machine if we no longer need it, or if we do want to use it, we can fire it up. So bear in mind, if you're not using your virtual machine, or not using your virtual machines, then make sure you stop them and put them in a deallocated mode, because Azure, again, is a pay-as-you-go for uh, platform so you will pay for the resources as long as they are running so we'll just wait a few seconds for this virtual machine to stop we will then go ahead and delete that and then we'll go ahead and delete the resource group so as you can see it didn't take too long the virtual machine um, has successfully stopped we can dismiss this notification and we can go ahead and say delete and say yes we want to delete that virtual machine but if you notice because it stopped and it's, a, it's in a deallocated state. So that's what you want to see on your virtual machines if you no longer want to use, uh, use them and you want to stop them. You want to make sure they're in that deallocated mode. Again, if we come up to notifications, we can see that our virtual machine has been de uh, deleted, which is good. So we can dismiss this notification and we can move over to resource groups. We can move over to our resource group here, Windows VM. And we can go ahead and delete this resource group and delete all of these other services 
that were created. So an easy way to do this is to highlight the Windows VM name and say copy, move over to delete, paste it into the resource group name, and then the delete button will highlight, then press delete, and this will start deleting those resources. So in a sense, we're cleaning up after ourselves so that we have a nice clean platform to work with again as you're working through your different labs or as you're training within the Azure portal. So we'll just wait a, a few seconds for this resource to delete as well. And as you can see, that resource has uh, successfully deleted everything. We will close this down, close this down, and we'll just hit a refresh a couple of times, and you will notice our Windows VM resource group has been deleted, and our system is now nice and clean again. So I'd like to thank you for viewing. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you for subscribing to my YouTube channel. I'd like to thank you for supporting me, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Hi, as you can see, I've logged into the portal and I've navigated to resource groups. So the first thing we want to do before we create any virtual machine or any resources is to create a resource group to put our resources in that group. It'll be easier for us to clean up and manage as we go through our Azure infrastructure at the end of the day. So I'm going to go ahead and click create. I'm going to go ahead and paste in a name that I have called Linux test. RG for my resource group. Click review and create and click create. Now this is going to go away and create that resource group. We need that resource group because that is where we are going to put our Linux machine in. I'm going to go ahead in the notifications icon here and dismiss these notifications and I'm going to now move over to Cloud Shell. In Cloud Shell we are going to go ahead and create our Linux machine. We can switch between Cloud and Bash, and this is an, uh, an example of cross-platform, so this is brilliant. So I'm going to go ahead and paste in some commands that I already have typed out in Notepad, and I'll explain these to you before I run these commands. So what this command is going to do, it's going to create the virtual machine. It's going to put the virtual machine in the resource group we've just created called Linux Test RG. We are going to name that Linux virtual machine Linux VM. We are going to use the Ubuntu version of Linux. The username is AZ user. And of course, we are going to generate some SSH keys so that we can connect to our virtual machine securely. So I'm going to go ahead and press enter. And this is going to go away and create our virtual machine or deploy our virtual machine. And this can take anywhere from a minute to five minutes just depending on the type of virtual machine you are deploying. So we'll wait for a few uh, seconds while this virtual machine deploys. And as you can see, that didn't take long. Our virtual machine has deployed successfully. So what we want to do is we want to copy our public IP address, and you will see why in a moment. So I'm going to click uh, Copy, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, just paste that into Notepad so that I've got that. The next thing we want to do on our virtual machine is we actually want to open up port 80. The reason we want to open up port 80 is because we want to install Nginx web server and we need port 80 open so that we can access that web server. So I'm going to go ahead and paste this command in, but I'm going to explain this command to you. AZVM open port is going to open up the port. We want port 80 open. We want it to open for the resource group, Linux Test RG, and we want it open for the Linux VM machine. So I'm going to go ahead and press enter, and this is going to go ahead and open up that port. And it won't take long, it takes a couple of seconds for that port to open. And once that port's open, we can go ahead and connect to our virtual machine. And as you can see, that port is open. So now we are going to take our public IP address that we had and we are going to then um, use that public IP address to connect to our virtual machine. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, connect to that virtual machine. So I'm just going to paste this command in. And of course, you want to use SSH, AZ user, and our public IP address. That's why I said we need to copy our public IP address because we will need it to connect to our Linux VM. So I'm going to go ahead and press Enter. 
And this is uh, giving me a confirmation. Are you sure you want to connect? So I say, yes, I want to connect. And I'm going to press enter. And this is going to connect me to my Linux virtual machine. And as you can see, I, I am connected because it says AZ user. And there's the Linux VM name. And of course, we can see the dollar sign. Uh, so this is telling us that we uh, have connected to our Linux virtual machine. So the first thing we want to do is once you connect to our, uh, a Linux virtual machine, is we want to go ahead and update that uh, Linux machine with the latest updates. So I'm going to go ahead and just paste uh, a command in, uh, in here. And this command is sudo update. So I'm just going to paste that in. You can type this in if you want. So we are going to say sudo uh, get update and update this virtual machine. I'm going to go ahead and press enter. And this is going to uh, go out and it's going to update our virtual machine. Once we've updated our virtual machine, we can go ahead and install Nginx web server using the same command but with the install parameters. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that command in and of course it's sudo uh, apt get. The reason we put minus y is so that we can confirm everything so we don't get prompted for any uh, thing to do. So we can install Nginx so I'm going to go ahead and press enter and this is going to go away and install Nginx web server for us and it won't take too long to install it installs it pretty quick and then once Nginx server is installed we will then open up a web browser and try and connect to our web server to see if it actually works so we'll just wait for a few seconds while this installs and there we go it's installed it's that quick so what you want to do is open up a web browser so I'm going to open up a web browser at the top here and I'm going to paste in that IP address and I'm going to press enter and there we go we have successfully connected to our Nginx web server on our Linux VM so that was pretty easy um, so I'm going to go ahead and close this down and of course if we want to exit out of this virtual machine you can just close it here or you can do it nice and smoothly by just typing a uh, exit and press enter and this will exit us out of that connection nice and smoothly so I'm going to go ahead and close this down and I'm going to navigate over to our resource groups and I'm going to click on the Linux resource group and as you can see in the Linux resource group there's our virtual machine with all of our uh, resources that it creates by default it's going to create a virtual network it's going to create a NIC card it's going to give us a public IP address it's going to create a network security group as well as the disk and of course the virtual machine if we move over to virtual machines you will see our Linux VM is over here and if you notice when we typed exit in bash all we did was exit our virtual machine we didn't stop our virtual machine so we go ahead and click stop and say OK and this is going to go ahead and stop that virtual machine what we want to do now is clean up our resources and the reason we want to clean up our resources we don't want to pay for things that we don't want to use so it's good practice uh, when you're training is to create your labs create your virtual machines create your resource groups and then delete them afterwards but doing it the correct way is really important so I'm just uh, we're going to just wait a little bit while this goes ahead and uh, cleans up our resources in terms of stopping that virtual machine once that virtual machine has stopped we can then go ahead and delete that virtual machine so we'll just wait a few seconds while that virtual machine stops and there we go that virtual machine has stopped and as you can see here we've got a no notification that it stopped successfully so I'm going to dismiss that and then I'm going to go ahead and delete that virtual machine and I'm going to click OK and that machine is going to be deleted. Also, if you want to use a virtual machine, if you stop it and make sure that it's in a deallocated uh, mode, you're still not paying for it. So you can always fire it up later at the end of the day and use it again. And as you can see, our virtual machine has been deleted successfully. And we have no virtual machine here. We can click the refresh button to confirm that it has been deleted. But again, we want to clean up our resource group. If I go to our resource groups, and I go to my Linux resource group, you'll notice we still have some resources lingering here. So we can go ahead and delete our resource group. So I'm going to highlight that. I'm going to say 
uh, copy. I'm going to delete that resource group and I'm going to paste that name in because we need to paste the name in or type the name in of the resource group we want to delete. Then I'm going to go ahead and press the delete button and this is going to go ahead and delete that resource group. And again, it won't take long uh, to delete that. So we'll just wait for a few seconds while that resource group deletes. And as you can see, it didn't take too long and that resource group has been deleted. I'm going to dismiss all the notifications and then I'm going to go ahead and move over and click the refresh button. This is going to refresh everything so we can see all of our resources have gone. I'm going to close that down and hit the refresh a couple of times here on the console just to make sure. So what we've done in this little exercise is we've created a virtual machine, we've installed Nginx Web Server, we've installed SSH keys, we've connected to that Linux virtual machine, we've actually connected to that Nginx Web Browser using our public IP address, and we've gone ahead and cleaned up our resources after us so that we have a nice fresh console again for the next lab. I'd like to thank you for joining and I look forward to seeing you in future videos. I also want to say thank you very much for taking the time to uh, find this video on my channel. I want to thank you again for subscribing to my channel and I look forward again to seeing you in future videos. Hi, my name is Ryan O'Connell and welcome to this training video creating a blob storage account. In this training video we're going to discuss what is Azure Blob. We'll create a blob storage account, we'll work with some blobs and then we'll clean up our resources. What is Azure Blob? Azure Blob Storage is Microsoft's object storage uh, solution. Blob Storage is optimized for storing uh, massive amounts of unstructured data. Unstructured data is the data that doesn't adhere to a particular model or definition such as text or binary data. What is Azure Blob designed for? It's designed for serving uh, images or documents directly to a browser, storing files for distributed access, streaming video and audio, writing to log files and storing data for backups and restore disaster recovery and archiving. Blob blobs, each blob blob can be a different size up to a maximum of, a, of 100 MB or megabytes. Uh, it's used for storing text files such as documents and media files. Page blobs. Page blobs are a collection of 512 megabyte pages which provide the ability to read and write uh, arbitrary ranges of bytes, ideally for virtual machines and databases. Append blobs. An append blob is comprised of blocks and is optimized for append operations, usually for activities like logging. Uh, more on blob storage. Blob storage supports Azure Data Lake uh, Gen 2, Microsoft's enterprise big data analytics solution for the cloud. Azure Files uh, offers a fully managed cloud file share you can access from anywhere via the industry standard message block protocol or SMB. You can mount Azure file shares from the cloud or on-prem deployments of Windows, Linux and Mac OS. Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer is a standalone app that makes it easy to work with uh, Azure Storage uh, data on Windows, Mac or Linux and uh, Azure are in the process, process now of embedding this into the portal which is fantastic so that's something exciting. The Hot Access tier out of the three tiers the Hot Access tier has the lowest cost but the highest storage cost. The Hot Access tier would be most suited for scenarios where data is frequently accessed for reading and writing what we would use every day. File sharing and that type of thing. The cool access tier is used for data that is not often accessed, which enables this tier to store data um, at a much lower cost. Uh, cool storage is ideal for short-term uh, backups and data that should be accessible immediately when uh, required, but is not needed regularly. Again, I encourage you to have a look at that hyperlink at the bottom there. Go to the Microsoft.com um, services storage uh, blobs and then you'll actually get a lot more detailed information about blob storage. The archive uh, access tier is particularly interesting because the data is offline and cannot be accessed immediately. The data stored in this tier would have several hours of retrieval latency which has a higher retrieval cost but a low storage cost compared to the other two tiers. Therefore this tier is most suitable for storing long-term backups and data which needs to be preserved in its original raw state, even though the data can be processed to its final form. 
The best example is CCTV footage to read the data that's stored in the access archive access tier. This tier should be changed to either hot or cool. Again, I've got the hyperlink there just as a reminder so that you can go and do some more uh, exploring and find out more about uh, Azure Blobs. Replacing tape. Any advocate will rule out that cloud storage cannot compete with tape's low cost pricing tiers. However, a well experienced e discovery lawyer will guarantee that tape storage is not ideal and is extremely expensive in litigation scenarios. The process of archiving unstruct unstructured data is revolutionizing long term data management. With its intelligent secondary storage environment, using Azure Blobs to store business data to deliver huge advantages. By using blob storage, data becomes redundant and self-healing, and due to the options for shadow copying and geo-redundancy and more. So it's really robust and reliant. So it's definitely the way to go. Remember, uh, we have some basic costs involved, pay-as-you-go pricing for blobs, scalable uh, uh, object storage for documents, videos, pictures, and unstructured text data or binary data. You can choose from the different uh, tiers, hot, cold, or archive. Again. The cost differs with each tier, so be sure to check what your needs are. Here's an example, as you can see, the, the premium costs, the hot costs, the cool costs, and the archive costs. And as you can see, the hot storage for us is only $1.39 per gig, and we're talking about New Zealand dollars. So it's something that you need to explore and have a look, and have a look in your country or in your region to confirm the pricing. But do your, your maths and do your sums, and you'll find that it works out to be a really cost-effective solution. Again, some things to know. The types of data that you can use Blob for. Photos, JPEGs, PNG, bitmaps. You can use documents, text, Word, Excel, and more. We can have files. We can store logs. We can store video and audio files, as well as backups for virtual machines, VFD, disks, and, and a whole lot more. The type of Blobs we have, we have, again, block blobs, page blobs, append blobs. We have three tiers, hot, cool, and archive. Some of the advantages of using blob, they low cost tier storage. It's high availability, strong consistency, disaster recovery capabilities. It's scalable, it's durable, it's secure. It's optimized for data lakes. It has flexible pricing to meet your needs. And it has worldwide access from any browser, from any location. So I hope this gives you a basic understanding of what blobs are. If you want to know more, again, I would encourage you to go and have a look at the pricing details. Uh, here's the link. Go again, uh, do a bit of research on the Microsoft website, and you can really dive into blobs. I mean, blob storage is really huge. You could do a whole video training course just on blobs. So enough said. Let's move over to our portal, and let's go and create our first blob storage account. Hi, as you can see, I've gone ahead and logged into the portal. So the first thing we want to do is create a storage account. You can select storage account from the drop down menu here or from your side menu. If you don't see it there, just go into the top and type in STOR and select storage account. So I'm going to click create and I'm going to go ahead and create a storage account. Again, I'm going to select my resource group, which is blob access. I'm going to go ahead and paste in my uh, storage account called uh, Auckland blob. I'm going to go next. Again, I'm going to uh, leave it at uh, version 1.2. If you notice, we've got version 1.1 and 1.0. These are legacy versions, and, we, and I think they're there for backwards compatibility. But you always want to go with the latest version, so we're going to select the latest version, and we're going to leave it at version 1.2. Click Next on the Networking tab. Again, we've got public endpoints. Uh, We've got selected networks, we've got private endpoints, and of course we've got our routing. And this determines how traffic travels from Azure to your customer. So I'm going to leave it at Microsoft Routing for now and go Next. Now next we are presented with data protection. And by default we can change these by default at 7 days. We can change this to 1 day, 30 days, 60 days, whatever you want to do. Uh, soft deletes enables you to recover data that was previously marked for deletion or that data that was accidentally overwritten. So uh, in a real world, you'd want to leave soft deletes enabled. In our case, I'm going to take it off because we're not too concerned about it because we're going to delete our resources and clean up after us. Again, we're not too concerned about tracking. I'm going to click Next to move on to the tag section. 
and then I'm going to click review and create and this is going to go away and do a validation process on that storage account as you can see the validation has passed and I'm going to go ahead and click create and this is going to take a few moments to deploy and create so we'll wait while this quickly creates as you can see we've now successfully deployed that um, uh, storage uh, uh, resource so we're going to go ahead and click go to resource and this is where we create our blobs now are we doing a container are we doing files tables or queues so let's go ahead and create a file share so I'm going to click file share I'm going to click add a file share and I'm going to give this file share a name I'll, I'll call it a nzl file share 01 I'm going to give it a quota of 1 GB again we can choose between hot or cool or premium depending on your subscription I'm going to select hot from here and click create and this is going to go ahead and create that file share once that file share has been created we can go ahead and uh, add some uh, folders in here or add a file in here in our case I'm going to go ahead and add a directory think of a directory as a folder I'll just call this um, docs and click OK and this will create that folder called docs if I select on that fo uh, folder to open it up and we can go ahead and upload some information so I could go ahead and I'd browse to my C drive I'll grab this PDF and then I would click uh, upload if I had an existing document there that I wanted to overwrite I would click overwrite that and I would click upload and this would go ahead and upload that document for us so I'm going to go ahead and close that down and as you can see that document has uploaded if I uh, navigate back to my blob storage and I go to storage explorer which is fantastic this is now built in before this wasn't built in and this is great because we can come straight here and we can access our resources we can upload resources directly from here by double clicking on that folder that will open up that folder for us I could go ahead and uh, create stuff again by right mouse click on there and creating another file share or right mouse click on there and creating a blob container called uh, I will call this a uh, blob one and I'll click create and again our blob container is where we can go ahead as well and upload files into our blob container as well and we can do that as well with our queues and our tables before if we wanted to uh, do stuff we could go ahead and open that up in storage explorer and we would click OK and this would take us to the Microsoft website and we would have to go ahead and download storage explorer and once storage explorer had has been downloaded then we install it on our server and then connect to our Azure but it's really good that this is now built into the portal because it gives us so much more flexibility so if I went into my NZ file share I double clicked on that and I said okay I wanted to download that document uh, I could just click download and we could uh, let that download and that document would download for us and I could say open up that document and there's my PowerPoint slide on the Azure that we uh, lesson that we just did earlier on so I'm going to go ahead and close that down and I'll click here to exit from there I'll go back to my storage so what we want to do now is clean up our resources how do we delete a storage account how do we get rid of our resources so that's pretty easy all we want to do is go to storage accounts we actually want to select the storage account we want to delete and it's pretty easy we just say delete now bear in mind when we delete the storage account it's going to delete all the blobs the files the tables and the queues so be very careful on what it is you, you're deleting so I'm going to highlight the name here and click uh, copy and I'm going to paste the name into here and I'm going to press the delete button and this is going to go ahead and delete that storage account for us so that we can clean up our resources so that we've got our next lab that we want to do and we'll just give it a second <coughs> to delete and as you can see we've got a no notification here saying that it has successfully been deleted so I hope you've learned a lot in this uh, training video and I look forward to seeing you in the next video if you do delete your account and you still see it here just click the refresh button and then your deleted storage account will no longer be there so again thank you for subscribing to my youtube channel thank you for watching the video and i look forward to seeing you in the next video lesson
Hi and welcome, my name is Ryan O'Connell and I'll be your trainer in this video, Azure Cost Control. In this training session we are going to discuss what is Azure Cost Control, set up a budget, set up a cost alert and do a basic review. So what is Azure Cost, Con cost Control? Azure Cost Management and Billing is a suite of tools provided by Microsoft that help you analyze, manage and optimize the costs of your workloads. To get your head around cost control, think of your Azure workloads like the lights in your room or the lights in your house. When you leave to go out for the day, are you leaving the lights on? Could you use different bulbs to be more efficient to help reduce costs of your monthly energy bill? Do you have more lights in one room that are needed? To create and manage budgets, you must have contributor permissions. With Azure products and services, you pay only for what you use. Remember, keep that in mind. More on Azure Cost Control. Uh, Azure Cost Management has alert features. Alerts are generated when consumption reaches a threshold. If you're not monitoring your spending, you don't know what to save. Budgets and cost management help you plan for and drive the organization accountability. Budget resets automatically at the end of a period, monthly, quarterly, or annually. And for the same budget amount when you have selected an expiration date in the future. To learn more about Microsoft's budgets and billing and cost management, uh, I would encourage you to go to the Microsoft website and follow the link below and that will give you some really great info. Again, some cost saving tips. Shut down resources that you are not using. Identify idle virtual machines, express route circuits and other resources with advisor and shut them down and help reduce your costs. Configure auto scaling. Save by uh, dynamically uh, allocating and deallocating resources to match your needs. For example, you may have a high workload and auto scaling will allow you to uh, add another server automatically and as that workload reduces, so does the auto scaling uh, reduce and takes you back to one server. Again, buying reserved instances can save you up to 72% over pay-as-you-go pricing on Azure services when you prepay for one or three year term with a reservation pricing. So that may be something you will want to look at as well to help reduce your costs. Again, really important, right size resources. Find underlined, uh, underutilized uh, resources with advisor. Get recommendations on how to reduce spending by reconfiguring or consolidating them. Set up budget and alerts. Create and manage budgets from Azure services you subscribe to and monitor your organization's cloud spending with Azure Cost Management. Again, if you're not managing these services, you may not be able to know where to cut costs or where to increase costs. Again, Azure Budgets, things you need to know. Once you create your budget, you cannot change the reset period, you cannot change the expiration date, and you cannot change the creation date, and you cannot change the name of the budget. What can you do once the budget's created? Well, you can change the amount you want to spend, you can create new budgets and alerts, you can delete the budget using PowerShell and you can set thresholds to suit your requirements. Remember the owner can create, modify and delete budgets for a subscription. So let's dive into the portal and get our hands dirty and get an overview of how to create our first budget. Hi, as you can see I've logged into the portal. In order to create our budget and our, our alerts, Click Cost Management from the Azure Services or Cost Management from the uh, Azure uh, left hand side pane or in the search pane you can just type in cost and select cost management and billing. Select cost management and of course in our cost management we come down to budgets. Select budgets as you can see I have a training budget already but let's go and add a new budget and I'll give this budget a name call I'll call it learning budget. I'll say that it's going to be billed every month. I'm going to say it's for this year only and I'm going to go and give it an amount of $15. This can be whatever amount you feel like giving it. I'll go next and of course we'll create an alert. So I can say when the budget reaches 50% alert me, alert me again when I'm at 75% and alert me again when I'm at 100%. And what we need to do now is go ahead and assign an email address to that budget. So when we get an alert it can send us an email saying look uh, you've overspent your budget or hey you're underneath your budget but not only that it also gives you um, 
an invoice as well, which is great. Click Create, and this will go ahead and validate and create your budget for you. And if I click on the learning budget, you will notice I don't have anything because it can take anywhere from 8 to 48 hours for the budget to start kicking in and accumulating and giving you some information there. If I click edit budget, you'll notice because I've created my budget, I can't change the name, I can't change the reset period or creation date or expiration date. How I can, however, go ahead and add the amount or change the amount, but I can't change any of this info. It's all grayed out. If you want to change this info, you have to delete your budget and recreate it again. I can go into the alerts and modify the alerts uh, again by scrolling down here and adding some more information and then of course uh, clicking save that'll save that alert as well so I'm going to go into a budget that I've already created so we can see some information so I'm going into my training budget and of course again the same thing with this training budget if I click edit you'll notice I can't change uh, m uh, much information at all I can go ahead and change the alerts or change the budget amount. I would have to again delete that budget in order to get more information. Again if I click on cost management and I come down into my cost management I can do a cost analysis and this will do a cost analysis on my budgets that I have or a cost analysis on a particular budget and as you can see there it'll go through and generate some information for us and we can use this information to better manage our costs. Again, I can uh, scroll down and have a look at the cost alerts as well. If there's any alerts, will display if I've gone over my budget. Obviously, I haven't, so I don't have any alerts. We've got advisor recommendations. Should we go over our costs or we need to uh, get more information or, or Azure needs to advise us on other bits and pieces. Of course, we've got diagnostic and solve problems so we can go in here and troubleshoot some of our cost management um, issues that we may have we can also grant access to various users uh, or groups that can go ahead and manage our cost and billing of course we can do a whole training series on cost management if I go to reservations you will notice that I don't have any reservations but I can go and click add and buy those reserved instances for a year that will bring my Azure costs down at the end of the day. If I go back into cost management, I can go into billing scopes and again this will give me some more information about my billing scopes. I can go to properties, um, I can go to payment methods. If I click on invoices, this will tell me uh, about what invoices are due and how much I've spent in the uh, in the last month. So I'm going to click download and of course you can prepare usage uh, file for download for a CSV if you wanted to or you could download it as a PDF. I'm going to click uh, download it as a PDF and that's going to download for us. And I'm going to go ahead and open up this PDF and as you can see it gives me information who it's being billed to, what my costs are and I can go through and see what my uh, Azure subscription is costing me and I can either modify uh, resources, add resources, delete resources in order to reduce my costs or increase my costs as I see fit. Again if I move over into my email I would get an email saying please review your statement. It gets, uh, you, you'll get this email every month but the nice thing about this as well it will also email you al an alert if you have exceeded your budget threshold. I know a lot of you know how to create budgets already and a lot of you know how to do this. Again going into cost management, clicking on budgets. If you wanted to delete a budget it's pretty simple. We just click the budget we want to delete and select delete budget and say yes and that would delete that budget. Going back into cost management, going back into budgets, we'll notice our budget has been deleted and we'll get a notification here and we can see that our budget was created or deleted or whatever the case may be. So I hope this gives you an understanding of how to use budgets, how to create your first budget, 
how to set it up in Azure and how to look for your alerts. Again, this is just a basic video giving you a solid foundation on, on how to get going with your first budget and creating your first alert. I would suggest that you go to the Microsoft website and do more research as they have a lot of stuff in depth on budget costing and analysis and troubleshooting and invoicing and various uh, topics around reserved instances and their costs. Again, uh, we can connect with AWS or Amazon Web Services if you need, need to. That's beyond the scope of this little training session. This is, again, this training session is just designed to get you up and running with your first budget and alert in Azure. I'd like to thank you guys for viewing and I really appreciate the support and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Hi. And welcome to this session. Again, this session is not a lab, it's just a quick overview of why should I get Azure certified? Maybe your employer or current or future employer is going to use Azure. Maybe you know the future is not one cloud but multi cloud, and you're taking the got to catch them all approach to certs to flex your well roundedness in the cloud. Maybe you think it's a good first step to your quest to, to make Bill Gates your BBF. <laughs> just kidding. Um, Whatever the reason may be, considering Azure, it's clear that the cloud is, uh, Azure Cloud as the runner-up is doing more than just keeping at pace with AWS and warrants serious consideration when choosing the Azure Cloud path. AWS may be the forerunner in terms of workload and adoption numbers, but the gap is closing fast with Azure. Azure adoption is increasing in enterprises, while the AWS adoption remains relatively flat. Microsoft has been making smart moves to play to its unique strengths using legacy footholds in organizations to ease reluctant organizations into the cloud. Businesses are continuing to adopt Azure as Big M pushes hard in this enterprise space. Microsoft claims that about 95% of Fortune 500 companies use Azure. Azure has historically been preferred choice for hybrid environments. Shocker, it plays well with Microsoft solutions. Businesses have been using since the days of dial-up. So that's going back to Windows NT, 1995, uh, Office 97, Office 2010. So it's been around a long time. Azure certifications, which are based on job roles, shows employees you have a specific skill set. Certifications make it pretty clear as to what you're getting yourself into. But whether you're going to focus solely on Azure or mix it up and go multi-cloud, there are a few misconceptions about certification worth clearing up before you invest time, money, and energy into earning them. Certifications are good for many things, but one thing they aren't is a golden ticket to that instant salary or six-figure salary that you're going to get straight away. It doesn't work that way. They're, they're more like power-ups to make your cloud career game a little easier for you and potentially unlock some shortcuts to help you get to the next level. Certifications help you get ahead by acting as an achievement or trophy. Nothing beats experience picked up from the ground. Again, get into cloud, get your hands dirty, push yourself, learn new things. Experience is king. Again, sign up for a free Azure trial play, create resources, create virtual machines, delete resources, delete virtual machines, play in Cloud Shell, play in PowerShell, create Active Directory Domain services, create users, delete users, get that experience. Again, certifications are proof of knowledge. They're not a substitute for experience working in the cloud. Again, hands-on is very important. Certifications are potentially door openers. They can help you get an interview or earn a, earn a promotion but they will not guarantee you a job. Remember that doesn't mean because you're qualified and you've passed your Azure exam, you're gonna get a job. There are a lot of uh, experienced guys out there, so the more experience you get, the better your chances are. Certifications are valuable. The average salaries for cloud architects range from 88,000 to 225,000. But certifications are not just about earning. Again, if you wanna earn good money, it all comes down to experience. Getting into a company that has Azure and learning Azure within that company, you may have to start from the ground up, but that doesn't matter. As you grow and learn, so will your skill set um, and your experience working within the cloud. 
Certifications are often used to get teams on the same wavelength with common cloud language. For example, you may have DevOps, you may have admins, uh, you may have uh, people that are deploying stuff, and you may use Azure, so they may all need to get familiar with Azure because that's what the company uses, so that you all have an understanding of a common language, in this case, Azure. Certifications, where do we start? There are so many Azure certifications. You can branch out and you can do so many tracks from DevOps to administration to security to uh, 365. The, the list is quite huge. But my advice is start with the AZ900 fundamentals. This will give you a really good overview of Azure and uh, what Azure does and then you can go from there. Once you've passed the AZ900 uh, fundamentals, I would say do the AZ104, which is the administrator's course. Once you've done both of these courses, you can then branch out to Solutions Architect or Security or Data or AI. So there's a lot of certifications that you can actually uh, branch out to. DevOps. Again, once you've done these two and you have a good understanding and these two certifications underneath your belt, the rest will be very, very easy and very familiar for you. So again, I would say to anybody that wants to learn Azure, start with the AZ900 course. It's an amazing course. There are amazing training uh, providers out there that can help you and teach you and guide you. There's a lot of resources um, on the net and on social media that are free. Some of them you pay for. Again, at the end of the day, the type of training, you get what you pay for. A lot of guys may even share knowledge with you free because they just want to help you grow. So hence this video as well. I'm also creating content to help you guys grow and learn and hopefully you'll become really good Azure engineers. Again, the new uh, role-based Azure certifications establishes learning paths from Azure fundamental level to associate level and then to expert level. So I would encourage you to have a look at the link below and go and learn more about the Azure certifications and see what best suits your needs. For example, I may say it's good to become an admin, but you want to become a developer, so work down the de DevOps. You may want to work with Teams. They do a certification in Teams. So again, it's all up to you. And having all this information at your fingertips will help you make a better decision. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this short video. And I'd like to thank you for, for subscribing to my channel. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.